Well, thank you very much for the invitation. And uh, thank you for taking up this very important topic. And I can tell you, you look different than the usual crowd. Uh, because uh, normally when I discuss this, I think the last time I did this was that uh, at the last ECOFIN when we finalized the deal on capital requirements. And in the same week, I was in the, the European Bank Federation, and they look rather different from you, I can tell you that. But, uh, but I think that basically there is the same interest in rebuilding, coming from very different sides and from a different analysis of the reasons uh, of the financial crisis. Uh, I think that rebuilding is a very good keyword to sort of get people together in a debate and a, and a sort of solution-orientated uh, discussion about what actually to do. And uh, it's exactly right that I am the chair of, uh, of the Council of Ministers of Finance and Economics uh, right now. Unfortunately, the minute you get the hang of it, it's over. But I guess that's just the way a presidency is. Um, so what I'm going to tell you is just a few remarks about the general picture. And then, of course, also to take you through some of the very concrete things that we've been deciding. Because it is sort of a hands-on task. Uh, to try to rebuild when it comes to financial sector. Uh, first of all, it is, uh, it's obvious that the financial and economic crisis was a, a game changer. It really changed also the mindsets and, and the way we, we looked at banks and states. Because it signaled a stop uh, or the end of a time when banks and the broader financial sector uh, could act as if there was no tomorrow. And it also signaled the end of the time where governments could act as if there were no tomorrow. And uh, much of what we have been doing at the EU level ever since, uh, the crisis turned good times into bad, has therefore been to, to rebuild of a common EU framework on economic policy and financial regulation. The goal being quite simple, to ensure that we repair the ills of the current crisis and that we're better prepared for tomorrow. Because for a lot of my colleagues and for myself, of course, we have sort of uh, this uh, not only rational, but also maybe some, some kind of sensation that we will do our utmost to make sure that the financial crisis 2008 will not uh, repeat itself. These two projects, better economic policy and financial regulation are uh, both uh, major parts of the EU strategy to exit from the economic crisis. Uh, the EU strategy also includes safeguarding, safeguarding uh, stability by, of course, uh, addressing and helping some of the most vulnerable countries, uh, that be Greece, uh, Ireland, Portugal, uh, and by assisting a return to, to normality for uh, the fragile financial system through stress testing, guarantees, recapitalization for European banks. Both doing that in a very specific way, but also working on it in a broader perspective. Uh, I'm sure that you have uh, been dying all day and waiting for me to come here and tell you about the very concrete directives that we've been passed during the last six months. But, uh, and I won't disappoint you. Uh, but before we get there, uh, just a few remarks uh, about the wider uh, economic policy lessons from the crisis. Because this is not only a question of regulation. It's also a question of how do we look upon the financial sector and the role that it plays in relation to the rest of our economies. The crisis showed that many EU member states uh, although this is not only an EU phenomenon, uh, did not, in fact, have uh, public finances that were sufficient, uh, sufficiently sound, sufficiently sustainable. And that is a kind of a, a paradox, because we have had five, ten years' times of uh, very good economic times before the crisis. Very good economic times. Those of you who live here in Denmark know that we all got new kitchens. And when we finished that, we got new bathrooms. And then people started looking at their gardens. Uh, because it was very good times. 
But most member states did not reduce their public deficits, did not re reduce their debts radius uh, sufficiently. They were not prepared either for downturns, which could come uh, from lighting from the sky, or the more long-term demographic, demographic challenges that everyone knew were coming. I guess that you all remember that before the crisis 2008, we were discussing what are we going to live from? Because we realized that Europe was an aging continent. There was a lot of talk about whether we should turn into kind of an open-air museum, and you would be the guides of Asian tourists coming here to see the cradle of democracy before they went home to their uh, emerging and sparkling uh, economies back home to be the driving force. That were never addressed in those days. And that, of course, also shows that there was sort of a general vulnerability in the dynamics of the European continent. Because we were not the most innovative continent. We were not the most sparkling places to go for new ideas. We had to rethink the way that we were doing things. Then came the financial crisis. And that also concerns governments, because uh, although bad economic policies primarily is a problem for the national government concerned, we have seen very clearly how problems in one country will contaminate the entire atmosphere, that trust will be lost, and that we will all be dependent of each other actually having a more stable and more thorough look about national economics. And, and although we had uh, already sensible rules of deficits, of debts in the European Union, obviously implementation was not sufficient. There was too little commitment to enforce them in a thorough way. Uh, and therefore, of course, when there is no commitment to enforce, there's also very little commitment to comply in individual member states. Of course. Why follow rules when nobody is going to sort of say you're going to have to do this? Therefore, we have agreed to strengthen and enforce rules much more efficiently and to make sure that they address problems previously overlooked, such as macroeconomic imbalances because some of the key figures that we were looking at before 2008, well, they looked pretty good. But if we have turned sort of um, the way of looking at it, we would have seen another perspective of the economics, and we would have seen the vulnerabilities. And that is what we are addressing with the new processes of macroeconomic imbalances. The follow-up of this decision during the Danish EU presidency uh, represents a crucial juncture. Not because that we have the presidency, but because that the timing is right for that. Because now is the time where each and every member state also deliver on commitments, also deliver when it comes to difficult decisions, on structural reforms, on fiscal consolidation at home, and when we hold each other responsible for doing so. Because we do not have a financial or a uh, uh, union within the European Union. We do not have the Commission or the Council to be the financial government telling what state what to do in what amount. What we have is what we can get, which is that each country have to comply with the commitment and the promises once given. And if we don't do that, we will, be, we will put ourselves in a position where it's impossible to rebuild the economics of Europe. But except from that, to have the ambition of uh, turning blueprints into reality, of course, we're doing something which is very concrete. Because the crisis also showed that there were very crucial flaws in the financial sectors. First of all, there was a, a widespread uh, underestimation and insufficient management of risks. And uh, this undoubtedly 
led to a system based on too much risk-taking. And if you have a system based on risk-taking, of course, what you get is a system which have a very strong instability inbuilt in the way that it's going to work. Uh, but not only did banks fail, authorities failed too. Insufficient regulation, insufficient uh, supervision also took part in creating the mess. So no wonder that we not only lost in the real economy, we also lost trust. Because if you see a system that is built on a massive risk-taking, and then it fails, then of course you lose trust not only in the CEO's responsibles, but also in the authorities who had the responsibility to look after what they were doing. Second, there was insufficient transparency and regulatory loopholes in key financial markets and in trading practices, such as the market for derivatives, which was, uh, well, Alternative investment funds were acting as a, as a shadow banking system. And we have credit ratings that we very much would like to change from what we're seeing back then. So the rebuild of the financial sector includes a number of agreements, not only at the EU level, but also at the global level. Uh, and very concrete uh, legislative uh, initiatives at the EU level. Um, it's a long list. It's a very long list. We can take it from here. Um, we have accomplished quite a lot already. Uh, one of the very early results was uh, to improve uh, cross-border coordination and cooperation in the supervision of banks and financial institutions within the European Union. Uh, new European uh, supervisory authorities uh, have been created and are increasingly given better and better tools in order to be a European supplement to what national authorities will actually do. Uh, the point is, of course, to ensure a genuine cross-border system of regulation and supervision, matching the cross-border nature of the financial sector. Of course, it, it may seem pretty obvious or, you know, damaging banal, but we did not have cross-border regulations uh, supervised by a cross-border authority before the financial crisis. Even though most financial institutions, of course, operate cross-border. We also have taken a number of steps forward in terms of increasing transparency. Because uh, there is almost no problem that can be solved if you put a light on it. Because if people can see what's going on, they will relate to it they will address it, and they will be critical as to what's going on. So transparency is a key factor. And uh, one of the first results that we uh, were able to, to take home during the Danish presidency, of course, building on, on the work of previous presidencies, was, um, uh, was to improve regulation of markets of financial derivatives. Uh, derivatives uh, is a financial, are financial products which shift uh, risk around the financial system. Some of it is, you know, plain common sense. If you want to, to cover your risk taking, then you buy a product which will do that. Problem is that when that product is sold and sold and resold and resold once again in bits and pieces and other components, then you get totally sort of uh, distance from the first product ever made. And uh, there's nothing wrong uh, with that, uh, but without proper oversight and transparency, uh, and without proper safeguards to contain the spread of possible problems, uh, derivatives could bring the financial system down. It is a high-risk financial product if not handled properly. This nearly happened in the U.S. in the wake of the failure of the Lehman Brothers. The new rule will shed light on financial products not previously visible for neither supervisors nor regulators. Another area for transparency is uh, the credit ratings issued by very few credit rating agencies. 
You, of course, knew the, know the three big ones, Moody's, Fitch, and Standard & Poor's, which are the rating agencies. And what they do is highly influential as to how products are ranked, how states are ranked. And uh, although I think that everybody appreciates that we can have a credible and independent rating, of course, that's a good idea. Uh, we saw from the crisis that sometimes the agencies get it wrong, so that investors thought something was low risk, high quality uh, investment was in fact the precise opposite. New rules uh, are being refined during the Danish presidency to ensure transparency concerning what the agencies are actually doing. What method do they use? What analysis is the basic of the ratings that they sort of influence the market with? Uh, changing to rating methods will be subject to open discussion. I think that is a very good thing. And it will be put out in the open how rating agencies are paid and at what prices, which is also a very good thing when it comes to transparency. Proper procedures are also required to avoid conflict of interest. And finally, the new rules ensure that financial institutions, regulator and supervisors should not rely exclusively on credit ratings. Well, it's good to have an independent rating, but it's not good if it's the only evaluation you actually get. You should get a second opinion, and sometimes it should be your own. Your own good judgment, not what somebody else is telling you. And that is part of the proposal. Then on banking, I think I will cut this a little short because there's lots of rules here. Um, but basically, before I get to a very short uh, comment about banks of the future, I'd say that uh, we've done a lot to look better at bank uh, regulations. A lot of things has been done already, uh, and I think that uh, EU is always al already uh, in the global lead by having set up a set of sensible rules to guide uh, remediation policies of banks. It's a very basic thing, but it does work. And, uh, of course, the aim is to ensure that the incentives of managers are aligned with the interest of the bank. Also, the long-term long -term interest of the bank, not only the short-term interest of the asset manager. And uh, that is to make sure that neither wages nor bonuses uh, encourage excessive risk-taking. Because, as I said a few minutes ago, what we saw was that excessive risk-taking was part of the problem. On um, May 15, uh, the ECOFIN decided on uh, capital requirements. It's a huge portfolio of rules. It's, it's literally heavy regulation. It's 600 pages. It's, it's a volume. And um, I think it's, uh, it's one of the most important pieces of financial regulation uh, at all uh, after the crisis. Uh, the proposal significantly uh, increases the resilience of banks by requiring them to hold more and better quality to make sure that they uh, have a buffer against negative markets, uh, developments and economic downturns. And uh, of course, it also requires them to have more liquidity because uh, if the market freezes as it did in 2008 and you don't have liquidity, for a week, for a fortnight, for 30 days, well, then you just, that's the end of it. So more capital, better capital, and more liquidity are the cornerstones. The consequences of uh, insufficiently solid banks are, at best, that they stop to extend their credit to, credit to the real economy. And uh, that is the balance that we're going to hold, that on the one hand, we want stable, solid banks by uh, asking them to have more capital. On the other hand, of course, we would like them to keep lending because the real economy, whatever enterprise you might uh, want to, to drive in Europe, you need to have a credit because that's the way we find these businesses in Europe. So that balance should be held at uh, any time. 
Actually, what we're trying to do is to rebuild banking to be counter-cyclical rather than pro-cyclical. Also by saying that in good times, you should make a buffer. And if you don't, well, then you can't pay neither bonuses nor dividends. Because you also have to have a balance. Because you are handling a very, very sensible uh, thing in our economic system. Just, um, just a few more reflections on, uh, on transparency. Also, when it, because uh, transparency, as I told you about it before, also empowers consumers and investors. That is their main tool, to see what's going on. And a number of other legislatives, uh, initiatives are on the way to, to increase uh, transparency, also with an ethical dimension. Uh, the Danish presidency is working on both transparency directive regarding information requirement for companies listed on stock exchange, and the accounting directives applying to all companies listed or not. And the current debates about how to ensure ethical uh, investment uh, by pensions funds, uh, I guess that is uh, of your interest, that is a case in point. Uh, and the way uh, forward, uh, at least in my opinion, is not for the regulatory and supervisors to micromanage. Uh, because... Um, we meet, need to make sure that decisions in, in private uh, entities are made there and that you take responsibility for them there. But we have to make sure that those funds make necessary uh, critical judgment themselves on their investment decisions and that consumers and pension savers are provided with sufficient information so that they can do the same and say to whatever um, bank or investor who's handling uh, their money, if that's what you do with them, then I'm going to go somewhere else, because that's not what I want to get done. Least but not uh, last, uh, almost literally, uh, we are working on uh, hoping to get uh, the Commission's proposal for bank resolution. Because uh, we need to make sure, well, how to handle how to handle a situation when it's almost the end of it, when it's almost the end of a bank or a financial institution, then what to do? And from a very Danish perspective, we hope that uh, they look to Denmark and see how we handle it, because we actually have uh, the evaluation that we have moved things forward. In Denmark, uh, the bank guarantees and our rescue packages were bank-financed. No taxpayer money put in there. I think that's a very healthy way of doing it. Also to make sure that there can be a bail-in, that those who own shares in the bank know that there is a risk of owning a share also in a bank, and that risk that they have to take that seriously. When I look at, uh, at banks in, in the years to come, and that would be my last remark, uh, it's obvious that banks and financial institutions play a crucial role in making sure that businesses can have the capital that they need for growing, for expanding, for startups. And uh, of course, uh, that capital have to be also, once in a while, willing to take a little risk, because otherwise no business will ever grow if you won't take any risk at all. But that being said, I think it's also obvious that the many initiatives that we're taking, well, they have the goal of setting the financial sector back in its place in our societies and in our economies. And uh, also by their saying that we need to rebuild banking into something much safer and less uh, hazardous for the economy at last. Uh, and in short, Maybe, I don't know if any of you have a dream of going there or have children who have a dream of being a banker. Uh, but I think you should tell them that it's going to be a little boring. Not much, but, well, much more than it were. Because uh, banking is going to get back, center states, solid, sound, boring, 
and taking risk in proper proportions with the transparency needed for consumers and customers in general to know what they're dealing with. In some respects, we're not at all out of the crisis. But we're taking the right steps, and we're actually working to get all 27 European countries to work together on this. Because if you want to rebuild, it's going to be a common project. Then you don't need number 27 and number 26 to start tearing things down the minute you put one stone on top of the other. Which is one of the reasons why we find that it's very important that all 27 are on board when we take these decisions. Because then we can, in the true sense of the world, rebuild the financial sector. Thank you for listening. Am I on? Thank, thanks a lot, Margrethe. Proposed by many of the international speakers today uh, was actually that uh, this notion of rebuilding and restoring is kind of like not the right idea. So I think I'm going to turn the E around to, uh, to maybe say maybe we should start building the 21st century instead of rebuilding. No, that was a comment from, uh, from a lot of the uh, guys uh, before. I'm going to start with the pension investors. That is uh, close to my heart. Uh, Balance Katilne run a big story on, uh, on uh, government bonds in, in Africa. Uh, we have a system in Denmark that makes it impossible for 80% of uh, the Danish, uh, Danish pension savers to actually uh, put up with anything but the CSR regulations of the pension uh, operators. Uh, that means in many cases that you have uh, your pension money in guns, girls and gambling, and at least in half of these pension funds, you're not able to do anything about it today. So we, we challenged them and said, why are you not doing more? And they said, well, call Magrede because uh, Magrede and the government regulates us, and we have to make a profit on behalf of our customers. That's a very sound principle. But it's like we're stuck in a, a lack of innovation in the pension sector today at home, at least. Uh, that means that members of uh, PCOA, one of the big pension funds, have no options that but letting their people stay, uh, let uh, the money stay in uh, weapons, for an example. That's nurses and doctors and healthcare. Uh, members and many of them are annoyed about the situation. So, what can we do about inspiring them for a little more innovation? Maybe not regulating them, and maybe inspiring them from the political scene. Well, first of all, I, I, I still find it very, very, very difficult to understand that you cannot find a prof profitable investment outside weapons. It, it, it's a mystery. Um, second thing is that. You need to enable people to, to know and to act. Because um, what we're doing here is, of course, to make sure that we can use the, the mechanisms of the market by letting people move their money to where they want to go, uh, but to give them uh, information and, and a basis for taking that decision. Mm. And I think that is a, a much more sort of healthier way than saying you can't do this or you can't do that. because. Agreed because the list will be enormous. Mm. And, uh, and basically, I'm, I'm so liberal that I think that even things I don't like shouldn't be forbidden. Mm. So when will the uh, investors in PKA be able to uh, say uh, no to PKA and go somewhere else? Well, of course, that's a, that's a tricky question. And, and that's because uh, some of the rules for, for changing from one uh, pension company to another uh, is, uh, is tricky. That's one of the things that we're looking at, because a lot of people feel that if they have their pension in one place, then it's, it's very difficult to move to somewhere else without paying huge amounts of money. Sometimes impossible. Sometimes impossible. Uh, but you know just as well as I do that part of our pension fund is also labor market related. And there is a lot of very strong interest connected to that, not only from uh, labor market uh, or employees' organization, but also from uh, employers' organization, which is one of the reasons why it's tricky. Yeah. And it won't happen tomorrow. Yeah. But... I think it will come. They're sharing all the pension funds in Denmark. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, just uh, just an issue here to, to raise in the political landscape because they're, uh, they're kind of like pulling the aid to you and saying, well, it's the regulation it's wrong with. I don't agree totally with them, but maybe that's a good uh, political debate about inspiring them. Let's get back to um, the financial debate and we'll take questions from the uh, audience in a minute. 
But uh, you touch upon uh, Moody and uh, some of these uh, credit rating uh, institutions. Um, I checked up on Lehman Brothers. Um, they had a debt to equity ratio of 1 to 33 before they got bankrupt, and they got a credit rating from Moody, which was, do you remember? Any of you saw the inside job? Yeah. Not triple A, though. Double A plus. That's the second best credit rating. That was four days before their bankruptcy. So I researched into, as I mentioned uh, earlier on today, the debt to equity ratio of Danske Bank. It's 1 to 33. So uh, just a question. Um, are we going to be able to bail out Danske Bank if they go bankruptcy, caused by the uh, housing market decrease 15 20%? Well, if, if that was a worry, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> uh, then I would be doing something else. Um, but, but the example is very good because actually that has played a, a role as inspiring some of the new rules on credit rating agencies. I think it has inspired credit rating agencies as well because a lot of them have changed the way that they work, the way that they handle things, uh, being much more, uh, I think, strict and thorough than they were. Uh, but what we, uh, we saw was that more regulation was needed. Mm. I think one of the, of the very unfortunate thing is that the market for credit rating is so limited mm. uh, that we only have these uh, three uh, huge uh, bureaus, uh, which is really there. So and therefore, I think it is very important that they public, uh, make public their methods and they make public their analysis. Mm. So that uh, when a country, for instance, is downgraded, that they put forward their analysis so that it can be uh, debated. What was the reason why you did so? Did you have a bad day or, yeah. or did you actually have something... Uh, sort of crucial uh, arguments for, for doing what, would, so, what you did. Sorry for teasing you, but could you imagine another system that would make uh, a credit ratings that are funded by the very institution that they're credit rated, that they're credit rating? So today we see in, in, in the Danish bank sector that the ones who got a bad credit rating, well, they are just leaving the credit rating so they won't pay anymore. Moody is financed by the banks that they are supposed to credit rate. I think that's why we are seeing some of these issues. So I'm glad to hear that that stuff is happening, and I think uh, that's a major issue on the, uh, on the uh, credit rating uh, issue. Okay, uh, we're going to switch a little bit. Uh, Uma Haig was uh, live from London uh, via Skype, and he said, and that's back to the rebuilding, uh, he said, as long as we still follow um, GDP as a measure of growth in society, we're going to get stuck with the same models, uh, rebuilding banks the same way. So what he proposed was actually what uh, Joseph Steiglitz and, and uh, a bunch of uh, great uh, economists did for Sarkozy and tried to crack what would be the new measure of, uh, of prosperity for uh, countries. So uh, is any Danish initiatives happening uh, in kind of like tracking institutions in the direction of other things than GDP, uh, measuring happiness or well-being? Or... There wasn't a European uh, debate, but where is it taken in Denmark? And uh, how is it going to affect, do you think, institutions of the future? Well, well we're, we're trying to find ways to make, uh, not to sort of dismiss the idea of, uh, of GDP totally, because that is one way of measuring uh, economic activity. It's not sufficient, but it is one way of doing that. So instead of just dismissing that, we say, maybe we could do more. And, uh, and there is a work uh, within government, I think it's uh, the Minister of, uh, of Development uh, Corporation who's in, in charge of it to see what can we do uh, to change the perspective once in a while and to make sure that we grasp uh, some of the other dimensions, which is not measured in the GDP. Because, of course, you know that uh, GDP will grow if, uh, uh, knock on wood, uh, I'm uh, driven down on my way from here and an ambulance will come and hospital will try to fix me up again. That is growth in a GDP way of measuring it. Not, not in my book. <laughs> so so there, is a, there is a work going on, and I think it's a very good uh, way of doing it. Uh, also, something very banal, things like asking people, how do, how do they themselves see their quality of life? 
what do they feel is important? Because then you have more dimensions instead of just uh, taking one away and, and letting do with another, hmm. but trying to find more ways of, of looking at society. Yeah. I personally feel that this, the happiness index is a little bit awkward. Uh, hmm. At least I, I find it hard to believe that the Danes should be the most happy people in the world. They're the most satisfied, uh, that's the, uh, the notion. But um, if you look at worldwide, if you look at worldwide uh, uh, measurements of happiness, there seems to be a correlation when people are really poor and climb up the economical ladder, they get happier and happier. But at some point, it just decreases again or stabilizes. So what we see in Latin America, for example, some of the happiest people in the world on every score that's worth measuring, uh, without the economic growth and prosperity as the, the EU or China or stuff, and also, uh, Uma Hicks said, actually, we're going to do some, uh, or maybe it was my notion, we're going to do some reverse engineering because the Chinese and India is now actually leading the game on putting focus on these happiness or well-being uh, issues. So I think maybe we're going to get inspired from them this time instead of the other way around. Well, I, I do hope so, because, uh, because I think one of the things that Europe needs is to sort of uh, get get much more in a much more committed way in touch with other emerging economies, because we need the inspiration, we need the sparkling, we need the new ways of thinking uh, about things. Uh, because in in some respect we seem to be so tired of ourselves mm. uh, that we really need uh, people to come here, and we need to go. Yeah. Uh, which is one of the reasons why. Uh, a conference like this is, uh, is a very good thing because you can make people come here hmm. and, uh, and you can do exactly this. Yeah. But, um, but I, I don't think that the, uh, sort of the curve of, of satisfaction that you just mentioned should be a reason not to go for, for growth uh, because growth can be a number of different things. When I would like some consumers to consume a little more, they don't necessarily have to go down in a toy shop and buy some, buy some plastic from, from, from China. They could also start of thinking, maybe, maybe I should think of the isolation of my house. Maybe I should have the double glass. Maybe I should have a solar panel. That would be growth as well. Mm. So it's not growth in itself. It's the way it influences us and, and how we handle it. And I think one of the reasons why, why many people are satisfied is because they're, they're in the middle of something. Because they are feeling that it makes sense, that they're creative, that they are in, in, uh, in a cooperation with others, mm. because they, they are rebuilding uh, in, in a sort of a very concrete way. Uh, and, and for whatever that's worth, uh, actually that's also what we're trying to inspire people to do, to say, well, if you want to take Denmark out of the critical situation that we're in now, well, then we have to get the idea that we can rebuild together. Okay, I'm going to take three questions from the audience because we are the only two guys between you and lunch and uh, dinner. You have been waiting so long. But uh, two or three questions. Uh, Philip in the front here, and there's a lady. So, hello. Uh, my name is Philip, and I'm a member of your party. Just so you know that <laughs> That's I, always, always make I, next, I, I, want, next. I want the best for you. <laughs> But nevertheless, I have a question brought on from one of the former speakers. His name was Jem, Jem Bendel. He encouraged us to ask a very simple question to uh, leading decision makers. He asked uh, us to, to give you this question. How is money created? Or oh, where does money come from? Or yeah. where do money come from? Yeah. Thank you well, for well, not you, pulling you, you into that position. <laughs> do you want the short version or the long one? No, basically money is just a smart way of making transactions easy. Because all value comes from human activity, one way or the other. Uh, and money is just a transformation. Uh, and I'm very happy for it because no, not that many people would like political advice, you know, just like that as a transaction for a haircut. Um, <laughs> We talk about a lot of things, but she doesn't take it as pay. Um, so so in, in that respect, uh, what is important is, of course, to make sure that with all the different transactions and all the different layers, that even though when we sit and negotiate about capital requirements, that we also have 
top of mind that this is about humans. This is about us. And it's always about us. But I think he's looking for something else. He talked. <laughs> <laughs> it, the, the thing about the question is he, 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 wants, uh, he wants you to fail, which is very sneaky of him, of course. But he, he, he claims that money is created um, and along with it more debt than there is money in the world. So we can never pay back this debt. He thinks the way that money is created is flawed and that we should come up with new currencies and new, way, new ways of exchanging values. Um, do you have any comments on, on the way that we create money today and what it does to our society? Yes, but, but basically it's like you know, a horror film where you're supposed the, the world to, to end tomorrow. Because if the world ended tomorrow, then you'd have a huge problem. But since it's not going to end tomorrow, and since states are not going to end tomorrow, well, then you, you can have monetary policies. And, and you don't have to make, to make sure that you only have a limited sum which represent a limited amount of, uh, of real values. Uh, and, and basically, of course, it's a very interesting debate, but, but if we want uh, societies to change while we're here, I think that no matter how uh, not creative, not rebuilding, like not sort of very innovative way of, of doing it, I think it's a good idea to take for granted that we have a national bank, that they're doing their job, that sometimes, yes, they print some money and they make more money circulate, and that works as well. Okay, he's tricking you here. Uh, the, the, the answer he wants is um, that it used to be the national banks issuing money, and actually today it's the private banks issuing money, on, uh, primarily on the basis of they believe to get them back. And that gets this 1 to 33 uh, debt to equity ratio out of uh, a trust in that these people are going to be, all of us, uh, loaners, are going to be able to pay it back. And he thinks we need some restrictions there. And he, he suggests community currencies and, and stuff. Let, let's have two more questions. This was a tricky one. Yeah. Well, I was pleased with the answers. Yeah. <laughs> Well, my name is Ricky, and I have a question. If banking is about to be now sane and solid and sound, why will it be boring? Why that message? Well, I think in, in, in comparison to what it were, uh, and I think that made great films, uh, because of the adrenaline kick uh, of, of risk-taking, uh, because that, I think that's... It's sort of a very sort of basic uh, human, almost biological way our body works, that by risk-taking, you get sort of all the, the endorphin and adrenaline uh, to work your body in a very different pace than if you say a uh, very much more conservative way of doing banking where you have less risk-taking. So in, in that, that respect, I think it will be considered to be more boring than it were. Also, than it were, uh, we have, you know, it changes during time in the 80s where we had uh, also a lot of uh, discussions about how the financial sector worked. Then it sort of changed, and then it came up in, in, the, in this part of uh, the first uh, 10 years where everything was extremely fast. Uh, Denmark is a very small country, but in the city of London, in, in New York, in, in, in other places. Uh, so I think almost literally, that people working in banking will feel that if, if they take less risks, if it, is, if it is more orderly, it will also create a sensation of banking being more boring. More boring. I think we see a different trend, actually. Uh, I think we see a trend right now that uh, some of the greatest entrepreneurs of the world is actually going into the financial sector driven by technology platforms, driven by uh, the willingness to change agony over the sector. So I think a lot of people actually are going, not in traditional banks, but in startups, trying to reinvent banking globally. So, so I think there may be somebody bored. I still think the shadow bankers will have casino rushes and stuff still, even though we regulate the normal banks. And I think we'll have entrepreneurs really going out there, and I hope you are some of them. One last question. Two last questions, and then... 
lunch. Uh, I would like to comment on what you said on going back to normal. Um, we had a few panelists here and a few experts talking about uh, a pluriverse, if you would like, on different currencies. Uh, you have the renowned uh, economist Mohamed El Arian of PIMCO, of PIMCO uh, talking about the, the, um, the road to the new normal. Um, what, do you have comments on the notion of a pluriverse, pluriverse of banks, different currencies existing? You're talking about strengthening the old system or going back to normal. There's sort of a difference there, and the panelists would like to recommend that you go towards a new normal of a pluriverse or something like that. Do you have comments on that notion? Thanks a lot. Well, well I like the idea of a, of a new normal. Uh, I don't remember how the proverb actually goes, but it says something like you can never swim in the same river uh, because the water will have changed dramatically uh, since you had the first dip. So, so I don't have sort of neither sort of a, a realistic nor a, a nostalgia for what banking was. It's not like every time when I go home and I'm frustrated, my kick is to see old versions of uh, Metador, <laughs> you know, coming completely down to, oh, this is banking, I love it. <laughs> it, it it's not like that. Uh, but, but I think that what, what I consider normal is that we do not use our speaking time discussing banks and financial sector and how to regulate it as something which is awkward, distressing, a risk factor to the real economy. That I consider normal. But I think and I agree that it will be something else than what it was. Okay, one last question and then we go for dinner. Hi, I'm uh, Morten. Um, I think this uh, conference is about uh, rebuilding a lot of different things. Uh, media and uh, finance and uh, businesses uh, could be could we think about uh, rebuilding politics too? Um, I think that uh, you have mentioned regulations a lot, uh, and um, that's kind of a stick method, uh, punching the banks in the head when they do something wrong. Uh, would it be possible to uh, use all the power that uh, politicians have uh, in a more positive way, uh, setting out uh, goals and maybe some measures that would uh, uh, measure positive things that uh, banks are doing instead of only using uh, regulations, like a carrot method, <laughs> a new way of thinking in politics? Well, in, in some respects, yes. But one of the reasons why I think that regulation is, is needed is that financial sector is also uh, having the privilege of administering uh, the monopoly of payments, which is, which is crucial. Because uh, if you can't use your credit cards uh, when you go out tonight, I hope you will spend a lot in Copenhagen, wonderful city. Um, well, then not slowly, but surely, but instantly it will break down. And, and since they, they uh, administer this monopoly of, of payments and, and having uh, the financial system work, I think regulation is needed. But I don't think that in, in general it will do the trick. Because as I experience it, uh, bankers and uh, employees in banks in general, they find their job as meaningful as I find mine, some days at least. So, so in, in that respect, I, I totally get your point. Problem is that we are in, in a, a period of time where not only sensible regulation, but maybe also more sort of uh, feelings-based regulation are being put on the table. And I usually say that uh, you should never invest your feelings in a bank. If you have money, go there. But feelings, invest them somewhere else because we will not have a better uh, new normal financial sector built on, on hate to a greedy uh, whatever financial sector. A lot of things have been said about the financial sector during the last four years. And, and not all of that uh, have the, the sort of um, 
the signature of the profile of, uh, of being sort of a carrot way of encouragement. On the contrary. So I think that a more realistic, more pragmatic uh, regulatory uh, uh, approach is what we need right now. And then when that's in place and we have a much more transparent system, then we can lift the gaze and say, well, maybe we can do something else. Also because there will be a different kind of competition from some of the starts up that, uh, that Sophus just mentioned. Okay. I think we're going to wrap it up. I would love to continue the discussion, but we need to go for dinner. We're going to send you Jim Bendel's video and, and Uma Haig, and if you got uh, like uh, two times 18, 20 minutes instead of uh, going DR2, it's actually excellent <laughs> inspiration. So we're going to do that. Thanks a lot, Margrethe, for being here. It I know you're busy. Pleasure.